Good morning, Year 6. Happy Tuesday to you all. And today we are going to continue with the White Giraffe. So I'm going to read to you today chapters 11 and chapters 12. You can just relax. You've done some activities the last few days and you've worked really hard sending those in for us. And we really appreciate that. Uh, but for today, you can sit, shut your eyes, relax, get yourself into a comfortable position and listen to chapters 11 and chapters 12 to see where Martine goes next with her amazing adventure that she's on. I hope you're really enjoying it. Uh, I'm loving reading this book to you. It's one of my favourites, as I've said before. Um, so just sit back, relax and make yourself comfy. Um, if I just give you a quick recap. So at the end of chapter 10, um, when we last visited the book properly, because obviously we revisited and went to chapter 9 to do an activity, but in chapter 10, if I just read you the last paragraph just to give you an idea. Alex's blue eyes blazed. He pulled into the school, slammed on the brakes and reached across to open the door. My girl, he said, you are playing with fire now. He smiled grimly. And you know what happens to people who play with fire. Martine tried to be strong until she was out of the jeep. But as soon as she turned away from him, the tears began to pour down her face. His laughter followed her all the way across the schoolyard. So if you remember, Alex had dropped Martine to school um, and not been very nice to her um, once they'd arrived and he was asking her about the white giraffe. So that's where we're at. Okay, chapter 11, here we go. Exciting. Right, nice and calm, nice and relaxed. Here we go. It is possible that Martine would have continued to settle into Caracal Jr. and, in spite of her shyness, would eventually have made friends. But on her third Sunday in Africa, something happened to change everything. It all started with a school outing to the Kirsten Bosch National Botanical Gardens in Cape Town, a place Miss Faulkner told them of incomparable marvels when it comes to the plant kingdom. Throughout the week, Miss Faulkner had drummed them into a state of excitement about it, promising them a weekend treat they would never forget, during which they would explore things like the fragrance and medicine gardens and enjoy a special picnic at the foot of Table Mountain while watching a world-renowned African band. Martine had looked forward to the trip with some trepidation and was very relieved when, a very short time after boarding the bus at Caracal Junior at noon on Sunday, she found she was enjoying herself. There was a good atmosphere on the way into Cape Town and some of the children were telling jokes and singing. Why was six cross? Cheryl Meyer asked Martine. Because seven, eight, nine. Eight, eight, do you get it? Martine was laughing harder than she actually meant to when she caught sight of Ben, alone as usual at the back of the bus. She looked away guiltily. Maybe today she would try to find a way to speak to him, to distract herself. She reflected on the conversation with Alex two days previously. The way he talked, anyone would think there was a conspiracy at Sarabona to preserve the secret of the white giraffe until it could be captured and sold for a king's ransom. And yet, both Tendai and Gwyn Thomas had insisted to her that it was a myth. Either Alex knew more than they did, or they were lying. Martine thought again about her encounter with the white giraffe, about the moment when she had first seen him towering above her, shimmering white like sun on snow, with patches of silver tinged with cinnamon. A shiver of excitement went through her. Nothing on earth would stop her from seeing Jemmy again. No storm, no lock, no game warden, no threat, nothing was more important than the white giraffe. The, sequ uh, the squeal of the bus brakes interrupted Martine's thoughts. They were entering gate two at Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens. As she waited to get off, she stole a glance at Ben. He didn't seem to have noticed that the bus had stopped. He was staring out at, out at the paradise of trees and flowers and Table Mountain rising into the blue sky behind it, and his face was alive with anticipation. At the Kirsten Bosch Nature, uh, Nature Study School, smiling staff greeted them with a fruit juice and a lecture on the botanical gardens. 
which had been established in 1913 and were spread over a massive 528 hectares. After that, they were split into three groups of eight. Two of the groups were to explore Kirsten Bosch with an education officer, but Martine's group, which consisted of four members of the Five Star Gang, everyone except Peter, plus Sherilyn, a big sporty boy called Jake, and Ben, was to be led by Miss Faulkner, who had done a special course at the centre to enable her to guide them. Their first stop was to be the Fragrance Garden. They set off over the manicured lawns where tourists picnicked and guinea fowl hovered hopefully for tidbits across a bubbling brook along the way. It looked innocent enough, but had a brutal and bloody history as an escape route of slaves in the days when the British ruled the Cape Colony. Legend has it that one slave who escaped here was eaten by a leopard and all that was found of him was his skeleton, Miss Faulkner had told them. Ever since then, this has been known as Skeleton Stream and the area above is, at, is as Skeleton Gorge. The older forest beside it is called Donka Gat, Afrikaans for Dark Corner, she added for effect. Many a child has been lost up there. An echo passed through Martine, a sort of chill. Her eyes followed Miss Faulkner's pointing finger up the forbidding slopes of Table Mountain, where forests of yellowwood and ironwood sprawled in a dense green carpet. The scene looked familiar, as if she'd seen it before in a photograph. Goosebumps rose on her arms. Less than an hour ago, the sky had been clear with only a few wisps of cloud over the mountain, but already the day was turning ugly. They had been warned about the unpredictability of the weather. For no particular reason, Martine suddenly felt apprehensive. The fragrance and medicinal gardens were wonderlands of aromatic plants and healing herbs, but Martine found it difficult to concentrate. At the dell, they drank from an ice-cold spring in a bird-shaped bath, and then it was on to the uh, Sysad um, Amphitheatre, where Miss Volkner explained that the palm-like Sysads were actually living fossils um, that were around in the time of the dinosaurs. Some of them are 200 million years old, she said. Can you believe that? 200 million years old. The final stage of their journey was the Finbos Walk on the lower slo slopes of the mountain. Finbos was one of the world's six plant kingdoms and was unique to the Cape region. It consisted of heavy type bushes like the bright red fire heath, silver trees, reed lilies, reeds, lilies, and pink velvety uh, proteus, which were South Africa's national flower. Sprawling alongside the winding paths in a blaze of colour, it made for a spectacular display. When they reached the Protea Garden, Miss Faulkner showed them the orange-headed, nodding pincushion flower, a favourite nectar of the sugar birds. Just then, her beeper went off. She checked it with a grimace, the wind whipping her curly hair. OK, everyone, pay attention, she called. One of the other children has suffered an allergic reaction to a bee sting and I'm urgently needed back at the nature study school. It would be a shame for you to miss out on seeing the sugar birds feed, so I'm going to trust you to stay here quietly and wait for them. Under no circumstances is anyone to go wandering off. Luke and Lucy, as prefects, I'm putting you in charge. If I'm not back in the next 20 minutes, follow the signs to the concert arena and I'll meet you there. As soon as Miss Faulkner was out of sight, mayhem erupted. No one apart from Martine seemed to have the slightest interest in seeing the sugar birds feed. There were a few visitors at the Protea Gardens, but the noise of the children soon drove them away. Martine decided that now would be a good time to try to talk to Ben. She walked through the flower beds in search of him, but he was nowhere to be seen. Where's Ben? She asked Lucy. Who knows, the blonde girl said disinterestedly, probably hugging a tree or something. Sherilyn interrupted. What's happening to the sky? Seven heads tipped upwards. The wispy cloud had become a, va a vaporous grey blanket. 
It had consumed the top half of the mountain and was sliding furiously down the cliffs towards Kirsten Bosch, driven by the wind. But the really creepy part was the sky, which boiled with a queer violet light. It looked less like a storm was approaching than some weather phenomenon, like a tornado or a tempest. Please, can we go back now, guys? It's freezing, wide Chevrolet. But the prospect of extreme weather had added to the atmosphere of silliness and the other children started chasing moths through the Protea garden. The sound of uh, marimbas, conga drums and African voices rising in exquisite harmony came to them on the gusty wind. The band had started playing. A flash of memory seared Martine's brain. It was the music from her dream. She was sure of it. That explained it. That's why Kirsten Bosch was so familiar. Her dream was becoming reality. And this was the exact scene. The looming grey mountain, the plum coloured lights, the swallowing clouds and the children chasing moths through the Proteus. Any minute now, someone would go, hey, look what I found. Hey, Luke was standing by a stack of wooden, wooden stakes of the sort used to create fences. His voice was excited. Look what I found. The others rushed to his side, Martine included, although warning bells were clashing like a 60-piece orchestra in her head. An Egyptian goose lay on the ground. It was, as it was a large bird with reddish brown and white wings, but one of those wings hung broken and its webbed feet curled limply at its breast. It stared up at the peering faces with one red eye. Though it flapped feebly, it was unable to move. Luke scooped the bird up and it honked hoarsely in protest. I bet it's been attacked by a fox. Miss Volpe said there were foxes around. Put it down, Luke, Lucy snapped at her brother. It's probably diseased. Yeah, Luke, it's dirty, agreed Jake. Martin tried to speak, but no sound came out. Maybe we should put it out of its misery, Luke suggested. You know, hit it over the head or something. Jake laughed. How about a, a bray, a nice little barbecue? We can put it on a spit. Should be enough to go round. Martine found her voice. She said tearfully, please, please leave it alone. Please don't hurt it. Ah, poor little English girl, jeered Luke. Crying like a baby. You want it? Here, have it. Catch. He launched the goose at Martine, who flailed blindly for, for the brown blur and unprepared for the weight of it, tripped and toppled over backwards. Somehow she managed to hold on to it through her fall. She struggled into a kneeling position with the goose still cradled in her arms, her face flushed scarlet in, with anger and embarrassment. The other kids burst out laughing. Did you see that? Jake crowed delight delightedly. That was priceless. He mimicked Martine's windmill arms and plaintive voice. Please don't hurt it. Caught up in the madness of the moment, none of the children noticed that Martine had closed her eyes and was trembling, trembling violently. She was remembering the goose in her dream. That goose, too, had a tiny pulse beating in its throat and brown silken feathers that were warm to touch. The bird's eyes slid shut as she watched it. Martine's first thought was that she had to try to save it. Her second thought was, how? Then a voice in her head, a voice she recognised as Grace's, said, You know what to do, child. And right at this instant, Martine realised that she did know what to do, that she had always known, all her life. Her hands ceased trembling and heated up to the point where they were practically glowing. After a few seconds, the Egyptian goose jerked and its eyelids flickered. She loosened her palms, it shook out its wings, and flew into the darkling sky. The world swam into focus again. Her classmates were staring at her with a mixture of fear, horror and disbelief. The colour had drained from Luke's face and he was backing away from her as if she was possessed. Hey, how, how did you do that? What are you, some kind of witch? Martine was just as bewildered as he was. In the instant when her palms were at their hottest, she felt a power as ancient as the earth go through her like an ocean wave and had seen in a puff of smoke 
a procession of what she could only imagine were spirits. Africans in the antelope mask and rhinoceroses breathing fire. Dazed and shaky, all she could think was, so this is it. This is the gift. What is it? Luke was yelling at her. Is it black magic? Voodoo? Maybe she's a umfakakati, excused um, um, Koza. In which, a witch, be careful. She might change into a bat or a bird. Martine sh stuttered. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a witch. You know, in South Africa, some people say that there is only one thing to do with a umtakakati, uh, Corsa said. They must be eliminated. Otherwise, they will do evil things. Martine cast a desperate glance down the mountainside, hoping to see the sturdy figure of Miss Faulkner coming to call for them for the picnic. But no one was there. You wouldn't. You wouldn't, she said in a small voice. Nobody answered, but Jake took a threatening step towards her. Martine made a move towards the path that led to the main centre, but the other children cut her off. She looked uh, beseechingly at Lucy, but the blonde girl was wearing the superlicious expression that she adopted whenever anyone spoke about them. That's when she knew that they were serious. Martine spun on her heel and fled into the twilight, screaming for help as she went. But the band drowned her out, drowned out her cries. She ran down a short hill over nursery stream into an evergreen forest. Only then did she realise her mistake. Ahead of her was a daunting wall of 330 steps. She halted, panting, unsure of what to do. But the clattering of feet and cries of her pursuers on the wooden bridge jolted her into action. She flew up the steps as if the hounds of hell were on her trail. With every one, the agony in her legs increased and her breath burnt like acid in her chest. At the, stop, at the top of the road, at, at the top was a road, but no signs. Martine knew that she wouldn't be able to keep going for much longer, so she plunged into the wilderness of yellowwood trees. Better to be lost than to be caught. Once in the greeny dark of the forest, she could no longer hear the noise of the city, just the tinkle of streams and the faint whisper and twitter of birds, bats and snakes high up in the canopy. A cloud oozed through the branches and hung above the narrow path. Higher and higher, Martine climbed. When she paused to suck air into her fiery lungs, she caught a panoramic glimpse of the hazy city miles below and the botanical gardens, now in miniature like a village made of Lego with toys for cars. Behind her, she heard the shouts of the children as they entered the forest. She dragged herself forward, wild asparagus forms hooking her ankles. But even as she, even as she did so, she knew she couldn't run anymore. Her legs were too rubbery to support her. All at once, an arm shot out from behind a tree and she was yanked sideways into a hollow. Martine opened her mouth to scream, just as she had in that long ago dream. But she was so startled and breathless that all she could manage was a small whimper before crumpling into a bed of leaves. She, 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 stole, herself, she stole herself for a blow, but none came. Squinting up through the misty darkness, she made out the face of her captor. Ben! He wrapped his arms protectively around her, and despite being small, he was warm and solid, and she could feel the fud, fud, fud of his heart. Martine! Martine! called Jake in a sing-song. Where are you? Leaves crunched under, under the feet of the gang as they hurried away, uh, as they hurried by. Ben put a finger to his lips. He reached down and picked up a handful of small stones and threw them as far as he could. They made a series of popping noises as they landed, like tiny bullets. Luke shouted, Over there! Come on, everyone! There were whooping noises and the crackling of fallen branches as they pounded away down the trap clouds, swirling after them. Martine became aware that Ben was shaking with silent laughter. He laughed so hard that he doubled over and had to hold his stomach. What is it? Martine whispered. What's so funny? Ben straightened up long enough to the point uh, to point at a sign propped against the tree. 
the base of it was still damp with fresh soil. On it was written, warning, raw compost tank. Do not enter. And that's the end of chapter 11. And I'm going to move on to chapter 12. Hope you're listening well and I hope you're enjoying it. Okay, here we go. Chapter 12. Martine said nothing to her grandmother about the botanical garden drama, which had ended with six of her pursuers falling into a stinking stew of fermenting horse manure, rotting fruit, decaying leaves and squashed bugs. Charlene had escaped because she hadn't been able to keep up with the others, but the search party who found them had discovered her babbling incomprehensibly, incomprehensibly after an encounter with a lynx cat and that had glowing yellow eyes. Miss Faulkner was apathetic with fury. She was particularly enraged that no one would own up to what had happened. Even Mrs Ratmore lost her sense of humour and said that if it wasn't that she thought the six had been punished enough by missing out on the band and picnic and being mercilessly teased on the bus to Storm Crossing, where they, they were made to sit at the back, hungry and glowering, like a broken survivors of a pongy mud wrestling competition. They would have spent the rest of the term cutting the school fields with nail scissors. What nobody could figure out was how Martine and Ben came to be sitting quietly on a picnic rug near the band, enjoying hot buttered corn and big slab of milk tart. Miss Faulkner had her suspicions and told them she'd be keeping a very close eye on them, but it was the wrath of the five star kids Martine feared the most. We'll get you for this, Scott Henderson had hissed as he boarded the bus, dripping, and somehow she didn't doubt that, that, that they would. Fortunately for Martine, ever since her grandmother had found her helping out in the garden the morning after the, the row, a truce had been declared at home. So much so that Gwyn Thomas finally relented and allowed Martine to go with Tendai when he did his rounds on the reserve the following weekend. He picked her up in the jeep at 4.30 on Saturday morning when dawn was nothing but a smudge in a star-speckled sky and drove her to Salbona's highest point, an escarpment densely covered in aloes, proteas and a shrub that smelled like curry. Cacti clung to the lichen pl plastered rocks. The track that led to the top of the escarpment was badly eroded and treacherous, so Tendai and Martine walked the last part of the way, and the sky was etched with fiery hues when they reached their destination. While Tendai unpacked their breakfast, Martine made herself comfortable on a boulder, still warm from the heat of the previous day. Far below her was the biggest dam on Sawabona. As the sun rose and her eyes became accustomed to the honey, the honeyed light, Martine could make out herds of buffalo, springbok and elephants drifting down the water. White egrets watched from the trees like a stiff paper bird of Japanese origami. Martine thought that she had never breathed in purer air, seen a more lovely view or heard any choir more amazing than the singing of the birds that morning. She wished her mum and dad could have could have been there to share it, but it made her feel good to think that her mum had probably visited this spot and watched the same sunrise. Tendai made a small fire and brewed up a pot of condensed of condensed milk, milk sweetened tea. He handed Martine some hot African bread made with maize meal, cooked in the coals of tightly wrapped banana leaves, and they munched contently and watched the animals in the valley below. After a while, Martine said, Tendai, can I ask you a question? Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, well. How did you get that scar on your face? Tendai laughed, but it was a bitter laugh, devoid of his usual bubbling good humour. It was a long time ago, little one, he said. Too long ago to be important. I was an angry young man. That's all. Martin could tell that he didn't really want to talk about it, but curiosity got the better of her. Did... Did an animal attack you, or did you get into a fight, she said. Tendai unbuttoned his khaki shirt, and Martine clapped her hand to her mouth in shock. His back and broad chest were crisscrossed with 50 or 60 thick, thick, 50 or 60 thick raised scars. It was as if someone or something had 
tried to cut him into a million pieces. What, what animal would do this? What animal would do that? She said. He said, no little one, animals might scratch you or bite you or even rip you apart in hunger or in fear. But only a man can crush you inside in your heart for no reason other than the colour of your skin. Martine swallowed. Tendai had a faraway expression on his face when he began to talk. It was as if he was seeing something that had happened in another land, in another lifetime. He had been 12 years old when his parents had moved from a peaceful village in the Drakensberg Mountains to the notorious township of Soweto near Johannesburg in search of work. For many years, Tendai recalled, it was as if the devil himself had moved to Soweto and turned it into hell. But it was just a hell, just for black people. Whole families lived in corrugated iron shacks without toilets or running water. When darkness fell, we burned fires to keep away the cockroaches and rats and armed gangs roamed the streets. He stopped. Perhaps I should not be telling you this. Your grandmother might not like it. Martine got up off the boulder and moved nearer to him. Please, please tell me she said. I want to know. In spite of in spite of the hardship of life in Soweto, Tendai considered himself luckier than most. His mother was a trained teacher and she'd helped him study in their shack. He worked hard and dreamed of one day being able to return to the mountains and buy a farm of his own. When he was 17, he managed to get a job as a clerk at a railway station. He was prouder than he'd ever been in his life. There was only one problem. Every day he walked five miles to walk uh, to work and almost every day he was stopped by police wanting to check his papers. At that time, it was illegal for a non-white man of colour, uh, so for a non-white, a man of colour, to go anywhere without an Id any identification. One policeman in particular, it was as if he hated me without even knowing me. Sometimes I felt that he was just watching and waiting to catch me out. Martine realised she, she was trembling. And, and did he? Tendai nodded. He caught me without my papers. My mother had washed my shirt and I'd forgotten to return the papers to the pocket after it was dry. The policeman began to strike me with his baton and shout at me for having no identification. When I reminded him that he had checked it many times before, he called me names and he tore my shirt. I kept my temper all this time, but when he tore my shirt without it, I couldn't go to my job. I'm sorry to say that I punched him as hard as I could. After that, Tendai remembered very little. When he regained consciousness, he was in a prison hospital covered in the wheels of a shambok, a whip made of rhinoceros's hide. When he was released from jail nine months later, he found that his parents had been taken away by the authorities. He never, he never saw them again. At 18, he was a broken man, living rough on the streets of Johannesburg, when Grace sent for him. It was Grace who taught me that the best revenge is forgiveness, Tendai said. Sometimes, the thing that hurts your enemies the most is to see that you are not like them. Grace introduced me to your grandfather, who changed my life. He believed in South Africa, in a South Africa where men of all colours are equal. Not everybody does. Why not? asked Martine. For some reason, the face of Alex Dupree's, as he threatened her, swam into her mind. I don't know, little one, Tendai said tiredly. I just don't know. They packed up the breakfast things, threw sand over the coals and head back down the, escar the escarpment. The grass was still wet with dew, but the early morning sun was already hot on their skin. As they walked, Tendai gave Martine her first lesson in bushcraft. He picked an aloe leaf and showed her how to squeeze the gel from it that could soothe burns or rashes, heals, wounds or calm itching. That was impressive, but the aloe couldn't even begin to compete with the marula tree, which was practically a one-stop pharmacy. Not only did its golden yellow fruit soothe stomach aches, Tendai told her, but it had four times as much vitamin C as an orange. It leaves, it, its, its leaves were great for dressing wounds or treating insect bites, and its bark reduced the inflammation. And that wasn't all. 
The stone of the marula fruit contained an oil that the Africans prized as nose or eardrops or lit in its shell as a natural candle. The Zulus had been believed that if a person suffering from measles rose before dawn, went down to the, the tree without speaking to anyone and bit the bark, they'd be cured. Martine gazed around her gazed around her in wonderment. With every passing day, she felt more and more that she belonged here. It was as if the landscape itself was creeping into her soul. She thought, she thought of it as a language. Every new bird call, every breath of wind, every new plant, and each fresh encounter she had with the local people or animals was like learning a new word. Put together, it made up the language of the bush. She hoped that if she studied hard enough, she'd be as fluent one day as the tracker was. Show me more, she urged Tendai, and he did. He taught her how to identify multi-layered orange mushrooms that were delicious if it was roasted, and how to make a cone of leaves to trap to trap dew or drain or rainwater. He even showed her the toilet paper tree, which had soft soft fronds that came in handy if you were ever a bit too far away from home. Best of all, he taught her how to make a natural compass. First, he selected a straight stick of about a metre long. He pushed it into the ground in an area away from the grass or vegetation so that it cast a clear shadow. When you're sure that that stick is standing up nicely, you mark the tip of the shadow with your finger or a twig, he told Martine. Wait 15 minutes. When the shadow moves, mark up the tip again. Draw a straight line through the two marks like so. This will be your east and west line. If you, if you now put your left foot on the first shadow mark and your right foot on the second one, you'll be facing roughly north. There are more accurate ways of doing it, but for you, I think this is easiest. Martin could have gone on listening to the bush lessons all day long, but she knew Tendai had work to do, so she thanked him and they continued down the escarpment. The path was overgrown and their way was frequently blocked by cacti and massive boulders. Once Martine was about to jump from a rock onto a soft pile of leaves, Tendai's arm shot out and he pushed her back so hard that she slipped and grazed her bare knee. She was opening her mouth to ask, a little crossly, what he was doing when she saw Tendai's sombre face lying in the leaves, completely camouflaged by the browns, greys and yellows were a dozen baby berg adders. Tendai assured her they were every bit as poisonous as their mother. Martine was shaken. It was the second time in less than two weeks that her life had been saved. What would have happened if I'd been bitten? Tendai smiled. But you weren't. But what would have happened if I had been? The Zulu refused to answer. With any snake bite, you must stay calm and quiet as possible. Try to identify the snake and walk slowly to get help. Urine, it turned out, was an excellent antiseptic and the perfect thing to use if there was no water nearby when a cobra spat in your eye. Martine tried to imagine herself calmly peeing into a cup or even her hand and then using it to wash her eyes. Ugh, she thought and shuddered as she remembered her close shave with the cobra the other evening. She resolved to give snakes a wide she resolved to give snakes a wide berth in the future. Tendai saw her expression and erupted into laughter. Don't worry, little one. Snakes usually do their best to avoid people and seldom bite unless they are cornered or feel threatened. Hmm, murmured Martine, doubtfully. And that's the end of chapter 12. And that was a long read, but I'm hopefully hoping that you really enjoyed that and you were comfortable and you used to be able to shut your eyes and you listened and imagined you were there with Martine. Anyway, I look forward to reading more for you later in the week and some more activities to do. And I wish you a very, very lovely day ahead. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.